What I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss a little bit of a broader setup. What are the foundations of East Asian uh, security uh, or Asia Pacific security in recent decades? As Minister Young discussed, and, and of course Vincent as well, the US role is a vital component. But I'd like to highlight another crucial source of restraint in East Asia that is not necessarily related to the US. And it is what I have labeled in my own work uh, the rise of uh, internationalizing ruling coalitions in, in most East Asian countries. East Asia, uh, the, the standard model in East Asia seeks economic growth via engagement uh, with the global economy and Taiwan was, was a pioneer in the internationalization of its economy. Uh, I have this um, um, chapter in a book um, um, entitled Nuclear Logics that, that really allowed me to uh, explore that uh, trajectory of uh, Taiwan uh, in depth. Now, the dominant incentives of leaders that advance internationalizing strategies or grant strategies uh, have been first granting primacy to macroeconomic stability and predictability, which are beneficial to foreign investment. Second, promoting economic and security institutions of, of the open regionalism kind to buttress the expansion of intra and extra regional trade and investment. And of course, T TPP uh, fits very nicely into that. Third, maintaining a stable <coughs> regional environment unhindered by expansive military budgets, which increase deficits and costs of capital, uh, deplete foreign exchange, thwart foreign investment, and so on and so forth. We all know the uh, consequences of, uh, of um, uh, military uh, expenditures, excessive military expenditures. During the 1980s and 90s, military expenditures lagged after economic growth and did not undermine uh, macroeconomic and regional stability as much as I would say is the case today, and I'll get to that in a second. Fourth, the fourth component of this sort of uh, grand strategy shared by most uh, um, countries in the region is that all the incentives that I just mentioned compel them to tame, tame border disagreements, history, maritime disputes, history disputes, and so on. So that relations between uh, China and Taiwan, Japan, Viet China and Japan, China and Vietnam, South Korea, Asia, and all of those were not, never built on harmony uh, to this day, but on the recognition that all must adjust policies and restrain unilateralism. Now, fast forward, we don't have the technology here, but <laughs> imagine we're fast forwarding to the recent past, let's say circa 2010, and what are the threats to this internationalizing model? Well, I believe internationalizers are still in the driving seat, sort of sort of, but they are intermittently challenged by what I call inward looking forces at home and abroad. So their incentives, all these incentives I just uh, mentioned, have become distorted, disfigured, and sometimes dismembered. For instance, number one, more aggressive vigilance over territorial disputes by most East Asian states and overlapping so-called air defense identification zones, those compete with the restraint uh, that I mentioned earlier and the mature diplomacy that used to be the case. Claims over islands and frankly rocks mm -hmm. have led, well, to rockier foundations <laughs> for cooperation, hardened alliances and so on and so forth. Number two, more aggressive nationalism competes with more productive forms of nationalist competition, like, like stands, um, you know, um, cultural competition, education, those are, those are uh, scientific um, competitions. Those are more productive forms of expressing sort of national prowess, in my view. Negative views of neighbors have replaced more favorable ones according to credible polls. And I'll get to that in a second. Number three more unilateralism and exclusionary 
regional institutions compete with agreed codes of conduct on, on the South China Sea, um, uh, agreed several years ago, and with um, uh, economic, um, uh, with, with, with the concept of open regionalism in, 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 uh, in trade agreements that uh, were mentioned by Saori. Number four, vigorous military modernization in China, Japan, and elsewhere has acquired more offensive overtones and competes with economic, environmental, and other needs. Military expenditures lagged after GDP, meaning uh, GDP was growing faster than military expenditures for decades. But China's growth in military expenditures ha have na has now surpassed <laughs> GDP growth in 2006, 2009, and 2012, according to the Asian Development Bank, a pretty good source, I would say. These things are disputed, of course, uh, but uh, this is a good source. Now, uh, this is, when I say they, they now um, have surpassed GDP growth, at least in those three years, one has to remember that this is a very large GDP, a very large gross domestic product. So military expenditures are huge, even when they lag after GDP, something to remember. Now, these changes in the region reflect a two-pronged pincer movement. Military, military um, people familiar with military expressions would, would recognize it's a pincer movement. One comes from domestic pressures from these inward looking constituencies, the anti internationalizing constituencies that are threatened by internationalizing models. And the other side of the pincer movement comes from uh, contagious diffusion. One country's nationalism, uh, this, this does come from the <laughs> from the diffusionary dimension of the presidential address. One country's nationalism strengthens, strengthens nationalism in neighboring countries in spiral fashion. And these dynamics are what we in the lingo of the profession call collectively stable. And by that we mean that it's harder to get out of them and restore the preceding uh, equilibrium, in this case the internationalizing equilibrium uh, that uh, was in place before. Competing nationalisms and militarization feed on each other's, on each other's existence. They induce escalation and undermine internationalizers everywhere. Uh, we're, not ye we're not there yet, I believe, but a complete slide, and hopefully we will never be there, but a complete slide into an inward looking East Asia could generate structural tendencies toward uh, militarized conflict, even when it might not be anybody's uh, ranking or highest preference. This proneness to brinkmanship lowers, unfortunately, the barriers to armed conflict. And voila, you do have a World War I redux. Now, I do not believe, and let me please repeat this, I do not believe uh, that this scenario will, uh, is very likely. And, I, um, and you, of course, see a lot of talk in the media or some talk in the media about uh, 1914 and 2014. And even Prime Minister Abe, unfortunately, unfortunately broached this possibility uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, a, very, a very unfortunate uh, kind of uh, reference. In China, once upon a time, there was a charm offensive. On the ashes of earlier autarkic models, Deng Xiaoping and his successors unleashed this uh, internationalizing strategy that I uh, try to describe, uh, leading to really impressive achievements. You know, people mentioned 600 million out of poverty and so on and so forth. An internationalizing str grand strategy required a peaceful rise a new matrix of regional relations. Uh, a, a charm of offensive, as I said, uh, that, um, that um, enabled better relations with neighbors and, and a new openness to multilateral uh, cooperation and regional institutions of the kind we were discussing before. From the perspective of internationaliz the internationalizing leadership in China, regional tensions and instability were anathema 
to efforts to lure foreign investment, natural resources, and really, frankly, broad international acceptability. Economic growth, domestic political stability, and stable regional environment were synergistic. Paving the road to uh, what I understand is a, the concept of a well-off society, Xiao Kang Shehui, I'm sorry I'm not a Chinese speaker, but Xiao Kang Shehui, yeah. The grand strategy, these grand strategies served China well, as well as its neighbors. But again, fast forward to the recent past, and this charm offensive is in some difficulty. A variety of polls show rising concern among neighbors, with negative views increasing even in South Korea. And I'm not mentioning Japan specifically, I mentioned South Korea, which few years back, you know, was, uh, had a very different attitude to the rise of China. But now we see increasing negative views uh, um, at some point uh, from 58 to 70 percent, Australia and so on and so forth. A full 94 percent of South Koreans believe that the U.S. would be the greatest force for peace in 10 years, but only 6% felt that China could play that role. So public opinion, I want to make sure um, um, that, um, to share this with you, uh, public opinion polls are very volatile and uh, you know, polls are not always that reliable, but I, I think they, they are tapping into something important here. Um, so. I'm going to be concluding very soon. The question is, are these internationalizing models in East Asia extinct? Not really. No, not anywhere uh, close to that. And some of the reasons why this is not the case, why internationalizers have not yet been replaced, also explain why East Asia in 2014 does not resemble uh, pre-World War I Europe in 1914. Inward-looking challengers uh, in East Asia face formidable opponents, formidable opponents. Decisions under President Xi Jinping regarding the, the further promotion of markets are particularly encouraging uh, as are moves toward structural uh, economic change throughout the region, TPP, Japan, all of that included. With much larger constituencies demanding employment, rising incomes, welfare benefits, and equitable burdens, distracting citizens with the outside enemy, the enemy outside, cannot work for very long. So internationalizing strategies across East Asian states have not yet been wrecked, but leaders across the region must coordinate a lot better, a lot better against internal and external enemies of that strategy. The latter, of course, includes North Korea, a rabid anachronism in the region. I think China's lenient approach to North Korea made sense in the face of it, getting the inward-looking autarkic kingdom to soft land via an, another internationalizing trajectory. But this approach has failed. It is time to replace it in full coordination with other members of the Six Party Talks. I have with me some uh, publications that address uh, what I think um, is, is a crucial component of, um, of the region and China's uh, grand strategy, and it was mentioned here before, the issue of sovereignty. Uh, those publications address based the evolution of China. There has been an evolution in China's approach to sovereignty. Um, and uh, it's also reflected in the application of sanctions, very, interesting, uh, very interestingly, not just to North Korea, but Iran and so on and so forth. And I trace those changes in China's approach, uh, the differences from uh, Mao to today, to those requirements of an internationalizing strategy. And it is one dimension of China joining sort of the, the, the stakeholder kind of expectation that China joins. Uh, not just the global economy, but also its institutions. Now, for China and for its neighbors, economic growth, domestic and regional stability, all of those are synergistic, as I, say, as I said, paving the road to this well of society. But this requires sustained economic openness. TPP would be a good way uh, to do it. Inclusive rather than exclusionary institutions. Shared codes of conduct on air defense identification zones not just imposed ones, 
incident at sea arrangements of the kind, the fisheries agreement that um, uh, Andrew Young discussed, joint initiatives on past and present human rights violations, and much more, much more. The US can play a constructive role in all of these efforts, of course. Uh, above all, I want to say that um, nationalism, I want to leave you with this theme, nationalism I is an infectious disease uh, and should be so treated. Nationalism does not bolster legitimacy. It entraps leaders. This is one lesson actually from World War I. It entraps leaders, leading them to their own demise, as both Japan and Germany uh, learned in the 20th century. I'll stop there, but if anybody's interested in some background work I've done on these topics, uh, they're there, and thank you again.